Chapter 12 Sex and Evolution Death and Birth, Birth and Love, Death and Birth in Ancient Teachings, Essence of the Idea of Mysteries, Man as a Seed, New Birth, The Meaning of Life on Our Plane, Eternal, Life, Purposes of Sex, Enormous Energy of Sex, Sex and the Preservation of Species, Secondary Sexual Characters, Intermediate Sex, Evolution of Sex Itself, Normal Sex, Infrasex, Obvious and Hidden Degeneration, Absence of Coordination Between Sex and Other Functions as Sign of Degeneration, Sex. Abnormalities, Condemnation of Sex, Pseudomorality, Rule of Pathological Forms, Psychology of the Lupaner and Looking for the Unclean in Sex, Absence of Laughter in Sex, Pornography as the Looking for the Comic in Sex, Waste of Energy as the Result of. Abnormal Sex, Morbid Emotions, Pathological Phenomena Taken for Expression of Nobility of. Mind, Characteristics of Normal Sex, Feeling of Inevitability Connected with Sex, Difference of Types, Strangeness of Love, Marriage and Role of the Initiate in Marriage, Plato's Allegory in the Symposium, Supersex, Infrasex Taken for Supersex, Traces of Teaching on Sex in Esoteric Doctrines, Transmutation, Transmutation and Asceticism, Buddhism, Christian View of Sex, Passages on Eunuchs for the Kingdom of Heaven's Sake. On the hand cut off and the eye plucked out, views opposed to the Buddhist and the Christian view, endocrinology, understanding of the dual role of sex in modern science, Buddha and Christ, the 32 signs of Buddhahood, Buddha as an endocrinological type, evolution of sex, psychological side of approach to supersex, sex and mysticism, sex as foretaste of mystical sensations, contradictions of theory of transmutation, impossibility of contradiction in esoteric ideas, different ways to supersex for different types, insufficiency of modern scientific knowledge for determining the ways of real evolution, necessity for a new study of man. The enigma of death is connected with the enigma of birth, the enigma of disappearance with the enigma of appearance. The enigma of birth or appearance is connected with the enigma of love, with the enigma of sex, i.e. Of the division of the sexes and their attraction to one another. A man dies, and the moments of his death agony, the moments of his last thoughts and realizations, his last sensations and last regrets, are connected with the sensations of love which create new birth. Which precedes and which follows the other. All this must be simultaneous. Then the soul sinks into sleep, and then awakes in the same world as before, in the same house, with the same parents. What happens at the moment when, according to the old allegory, the serpent bites its own tail, and when the death agony of one life comes into contact with the sensations of love which begin another life? In the idea of the interrelation of love and death may lie the explanation of many of the incomprehensible phenomena of our life. Many allegories in ancient teachings, which are obscure to us, may refer to the same idea, such are the relation between death and resurrection in the mysteries, the idea of mystical death and mystical birth, and so on. In ancient teachings and cults the words, death, and, birth, contain some strange enigma. These words had not one but several meanings. Sometimes, birth, signified death, sometimes, death, signified birth. The idea may have two meanings. The first is from the point of view of eternal recurrence, death, that is, the end of one life, is birth, the beginning of another life. And the second meaning, which is much more complex, is that death on our plane of being may be birth on some other, superhuman, plane of being. But here it is necessary to proceed very carefully in order to avoid the spiritualistic understanding of death as birth and birth as death, when physical death is regarded as birth on the astral plane in the world of spirits. And death in the world of spirits is regarded as birth on our plane. While at the same time a spirit differs very little from man, or even does not differ at all in his inner characteristics. The idea of the ancient mysteries is certainly far from such a two-dimensional view. The essence of the idea of the mysteries lies in the analogy of the incomprehensible new birth with the circumstances of man's physical birth on earth. Two sides are particularly emphasized here, 
first, the passing of one into a new life simultaneously with the death of many and, second, the enormous difference between that which dies and that which is born, that is. Between the germ or the seed and the human being who is born from it and who in his turn is a germ or a seed of another, a higher being, differing from him as much as man differs from the seed. Death is death. Death is not birth. But death contains the possibility of birth. Moreover, birth, taking place on some different plane, cannot be visible or comprehensible on the plane on which death takes place. This was the content of the mysteries concerning death and birth. People, as was pointed out earlier, CCH4, were regarded as grains, as seeds, in the most real sense. The whole of their life was nothing but the life of seeds, that is, a life which has no meaning by itself and which contains only one important moment, birth, i.e. the death of the seed. This was the secret which was revealed to the initiated. The idea was that having learned, that is, having fully understood and felt, this secret, the man could no longer remain as he was before. The new understanding began to work within by itself, to give new meaning to the whole of life and to guide his own life and activities along a new path. If we could accept the idea of none as a seed and if we could find confirmation of it as a theory, this would radically change all our conceptions of man and humanity and would explain at once many things at which before we have only dimly guessed. The life which we know, in itself contains no aim. This is the reason why there is so much that is strange, incomprehensible and inexplicable in it. And indeed it cannot be explained by itself. Neither its sufferings nor its joys, neither its beginning nor its end, nor its greatest achievements, have any meaning. All these are either a preparation for some other, future, life, or merely nothing. By itself life here, on our plane, has no value, no meaning and no point. It is too short, too unreal, too ephemeral, too illusory, for anything to be demanded of it, for anything to be built upon it, for anything to be created out of it. Its whole meaning lies in another, a new, a future, life, which follows upon, birth. Does not this appear as the inner meaning of religious teachings of esoteric origin, particularly of Christianity? And does it not explain all that especially strikes us in life as incongruous and incompatible? If we, that is humanity, are only seeds, only germs, there cannot, nor could there possibly be, any meaning in our life on this plane. The whole meaning lies in birth and in another, a future, life. But, birth, on that plane, i.e. on the plane of an unknown new level of being, is neither accidental nor mechanical. This new birth cannot be the result of solely external causes and conditions, as birth on our plane of being seems to be. The new birth is a matter of will, a matter of the desire and efforts of the grain itself. This was the basis of the idea of initiation, which led to birth, and also of the idea of salvation and attainment to eternal life. Eternal life is a term which has several meanings. And it seems to contain a contradiction, on the one hand, eternal life belongs not only to all people but even to everything that exists, while on the other hand it is necessary to be born again in order to obtain it. This contradiction would be inexplicable, if the difference between the fifth and the sixth dimensions had not been previously established. Both the one and the other are eternity. But one is unalterable repetition, always with the same end, and the other is escape from this repetition. Thus we see two ideas of birth, birth on the same plane, continuation of life. And birth on another plane, regeneration, transformation, escape from the first plane. This escape may imply so many new facts which are quite unknown and inconceivable on our plane that we can have no clear idea about the consequences of escape. Birth, in the ordinary sense of the word, is connected with sex, i.e. with the division of the sexes and with their attraction to one another, with love. This attraction of the sexes to one another constitutes one of the chief motive forces in life, and its intensity and the forms of its manifestation determine almost all other characteristics and qualities in man. As a rule, the stronger a man or woman, the greater the attraction that draws them to the opposite sex. The richer a man or woman is intellectually and emotionally, 
the greater is their understanding and appreciation of sex and all that is connected with sex. If there are exceptions they are very rare, and therefore they only prove the rule. But even the most general view of the role of sex in life reveals the fact that the original aim of sex, that is, the continuation of life, or birth, recedes and is lost amid the clamor, the flash and sparkle. Of the emotions created by this eternal attraction and repulsion between the sexes. From the ordinary point of view, in creating love, that is, in creating the division of the sexes and everything connected with it, nature has only one aim, the continuation of life. But even from the ordinary point of view it is perfectly clear, and there can be no doubt about it, that nature has created in man much more, love, than is actually necessary for the purpose of the continuation of life. All this surplus of love must be used up somehow. And under ordinary conditions it is used up by being transformed into other emotions and other kinds of energy, which often are contradictory, harmful from the point of view of evolution, pathological, incompatible with one another, and destructive. If it were possible to calculate how small a proportion of sex energy is actually used for the continuation of life, we should understand the basic principle of many of the actions of nature. Nature creates an immense pressure, an immense tension, in order to attain a certain aim, but in actual fact uses for the attainment of this aim only an infinitesimal fraction of the energy created. And yet without this immense inflow of force the original aim would probably not be attained, and nature would be unable to make people serve her and continue their species to serve her. People would begin to bargain with nature, to make conditions, to demand concessions, to ask alleviations, and nature would have to yield. The guarantee against this is the surplus of energy which blinds a man, makes him a slave, forces him to serve the purposes of nature in the belief that he is serving himself, his own passions, his own desires. Or, on the contrary, it makes man believe that he is serving the purposes of nature, while in reality he serves his own passions and desires. Apart from the first and obvious aim, the continuation of life and the securing of this continuation, sex serves two more aims of nature. And the existence of these two aims explains why the energy of sex is created in much greater quantity than is necessary for the continuation of life. One of these aims is the keeping up of the breed, the preservation of the species at a definite level, that is, what is ordinarily called evolution. Though, evolution, is usually endowed with other properties which in reality it does not possess. But what is possible in the sense of evolution, and what actually exists, exists at the expense of the energy of sex. If the energy of sex in the particular, breed, is lacking, degeneration begins. The other, far more deeply hidden, aim of nature is evolution in the true meaning of the word, that is, the development of man in the direction of the acquisition by him of higher consciousness and the opening up of his latent forces and faculties. The explanation of this latter possibility in connection with the using of sex energy for this purpose forms the content and meaning of all esoteric teachings. Thus sex contains not only two but three aims, three possibilities. Before we pass to the third aim, that is, to the possibility of real evolution, or the attainment of higher consciousness, we will examine the second, that is, the preservation of the species. If we take man and try to determine, on the basis of all our biological knowledge, what in man is the indication of the breed, that is, the indication of the preservation of species, we shall obtain an exact and very significant answer. In a human being, both in man and in woman, there are definite anatomical and physiological traits of the breed, and a high development of these traits points to a sound type. Whereas a weak expression or a wrong expression of them definitely points to a degenerating type. These traits are the so-called secondary sex characters. Secondary sex characters is the name applied to features and qualities which though not indispensable for the normal existence of the sex functions, that is, for all the sensations and phenomena connected with these functions are nevertheless closely connected with the primary characters. This is shown by the fact that secondary characters depend upon the primary, that is, they are immediately modified, become weaker or even disappear, in the case of the weakening of direct functions or injury to the sex organs, that is. In case of change of the primary characters. 
Secondary characters are all those features, apart from the sex organs themselves, which make man and woman different from and unlike one another. These features are a difference in the lines of the body, independently of the anatomical structure of the skeleton, a different distribution of muscles and fat on the body, difference in movements, different distribution of hair on the body. A different voice, difference in instincts, sensations, tastes, temperament, emotions, reaction to external stimuli, etc. And further, a different mentality, all that makes up feminine psychology and masculine psychology. Academic biology does not attach sufficient importance to the study of secondary characters, and there is a tendency to limit the application of this term to those characters only which are very closely connected with sex functions. But in medicine the study of secondary characters and of their alterations often serves as a basis for the right distinguishing of various pathological states and for right diagnosis. It has been established beyond doubt for both man and woman that a weakening or an anatomical change of the essential parts of the sex organs, or their injury, leads to a complete alteration of the external type and to a change in the secondary characters, different for men and women, but in both cases following a certain definite system. That is to say, in a man, an injury to his sex organs and the derangement of their functions cause him to resemble either a child or an old woman, and in a woman the same thing causes her to resemble a man. This gives the possibility of the converse conclusion, namely, that a type differing from the normal type, that is, a man with the features, properties and characters of a woman, or a woman with the features, properties and characters of a man, indicates, firstly, degeneration and, secondly, wrong development, that is, usually underdevelopment, of the primary characters. Thus normal development of sex is a necessary condition of a rightly developing type, and abundance and richness of secondary characters points to an improving, an ascending type. The decline of the type, the decline of the breed, always means the weakening and alteration of secondary characters, that is, the appearance of masculine characters in a woman and feminine characters in a man. Intermediate sex is the most characteristic phenomenon of degeneration. Normal development of sex is necessary for the preservation and improvement of the breed. The second aim of nature which is attained in this case is perfectly clear. And it is clear that the surplus of sex energy is used precisely for the improvement of the breed. The third aim of nature connected with sex, that is the evolution of man toward superman, diners from the first two aims in that it requires conscious actions on the part of the man himself, and a definite orientation of his whole life. An idea of which is given by the systems of yoga. Almost all the occult teachings which recognize the possibility of the evolution or transformation of man see the basis of this possible transformation in the transmutation, that is, in the conversion of certain matters or energies into quite different matters or energies, in this case in the transformation of sex energy into energy of a higher order. This is the inner meaning, sometimes deeply hidden, sometimes almost obvious, of many occult teachings, of theories of alchemy, of various forms of mysticism, of yoga systems, and the like. In all teachings that admit the possibility of the change and inner growth of an individual man, that is, evolution not in a biological or anthropological sense, but as applying to the individual. This evolution is always based on the transmutation of sex energy. The utilization of this energy, which is wasted unproductively in ordinary life, creates in a man's soul the force which leads him to the superhuman. There is no other force in man which could replace sex energy. All other energies, intellect, will, feeling, feed on the surplus of sex energy, grow out of it and live by it. The mystical birth of man, of which many systems speak, is based on transmutation, that is, on the transmutation of sex energy. There are many occult and religious systems which not only recognize this, but attempt to give practical directions as to how to curb the energy of sex and how to subject it to the interests of inner evolution. These directions are usually utterly fantastic and cannot give any results, because they omit something which is most vital and most necessary. Nevertheless, the study of such theories and methods presents a certain interest from the psychological and historical point of view. But before coming to the study of the ideas of transmutation, both in their right form, from the very few existing sources, 
and in their wrong form, from the very numerous sources. It is necessary to elucidate certain aspects of the biology and functioning of sex when it fulfills the two first designs of nature. Namely, it is necessary to establish whether sex in itself evolves. Can forms of evolving sex be found in man? Does the evolution of sex exist, that is, the evolution of primary characters and evolution of sex functions, and what does the evolution of sex functions mean? If evolution of sex exists, there should be forms lower than the form we consider normal, and there should be forms higher than the form we consider normal. What then is the lower form and what is the higher form? The moment we ask ourselves this question we are confused and perplexed by the ordinary conceptions of naive Darwinism and of the usual evolutionary theories, which tell us of lower forms of sex in lower organisms, in plants, etc. Of the propagation of fungi and the like. But all this is quite outside the scope of the question we have set ourselves. We are dealing only with man, and we must think only of man. In examining the question before us we must try to establish what constitutes normal sex in man, then determine the lower forms of the sex life of man, that is. The forms which correspond to a degenerating type or to a type arrested in its development, and then determine the higher, that is, evolving, forms, if such forms exist. The difficulty of defining normal sex is created first of all by the indeterminateness of the characteristics and properties of lower sex, also by the complete absence of any understanding of what higher sex may be, and, further, at times even by the confusing of the lower with the higher, of the degenerating with the evolving. Taking all this into consideration, it is necessary, before attempting to define normal sex, to determine lower sex, or infrasex. A beginning has to be made with infrasex because an understanding of suprasex can be arrived at only through the elimination of everything that is determined first as infrasex, and second as normal sex. It is comparatively easy to establish infrasex, if we take as its chief characteristic arrested development or a degeneration which has begun or is beginning. But the detection of infrasex is impeded by the variety and contradictory character of the forms in which infrasex is manifested and especially by the fact that some of these forms, from the ordinary point of view, appear to be a strengthening and an exaggerated development of sex energy, sex desires and sex sensations. Therefore from the very beginning infrasex must be divided into two categories, obvious degeneration and hidden degeneration. To the first category of infrasex belong most declining forms of manifestation of sex such as all obvious sex abnormalities that is underdeveloped sex, all perversions, in the sense of either abnormal sex desires or abnormal sex abstinence. Disgust of sex, fear of sex, indifference to sex, interest in one's own sex, though the latter has quite a different meaning in men from what it has in women, and in women it is not necessarily a sign of infrasex. To the second category of infrasex belong cases which are often connected with heightened intensity of sex life, which while externally appearing to be normal, though exaggerated, in reality also point to inner degeneration. This category of infrasex will be dealt with later. For all categories of infrasex the fundamental characteristic is the absence of coordination between the idea of sex and the ideas of other normal functions of man. Sex always leads people of infrasex either into temptation, or sin, or crime, or insanity, or debauchery. For normal man or woman sex contains no danger. In a normal human being sex harmonizes with all other functions, including the emotional and intellectual, and even with the desire for the miraculous, if such exists in the soul of a man. A man's thoughts, emotions, aspirations, none of them contradict sex, nor does sex contradict them. Sex inwardly is completely justified in normal man, and this justification is based solely on the full coordination of sex with the intellectual and emotional functions. But if a man is born abnormal or becomes abnormal a negative attitude towards sex and condemnation of sex almost always grow within him. Abnormalities may be very different. There may be total impotence, incapacity both for external function and for sensation. There may be capacity for sensation connected with incapacity for external function, that is, the presence of desires, but the impossibility of satisfying them. 
there may be capacity for external function connected with complete absence of sensation. There may be capacity for sensation only on the condition of abnormal external functions. In all these cases sex sensations are accompanied by a feeling of disharmony between sex and other sides of inner life, particularly with the higher, or those which are taken to be the higher. And as a result there arises a non-understanding of sex, terror of sex and disgust of sex. Infrasex which condemns sex and repels it as, offense, represents a very curious phenomenon in the life and in the history of humanity. In this case sex and all that refers to sex is declared to be sin. Woman is the instrument of the devil, man is the devil, the tempter. The ideal of purity is sexual impotence, infantile, senile or pathological, which in this case is manifested either in abstinence, taken for an act of will, or in absence of interest, toward sex. Which is explained by the prevalence of other, spiritual, interests. In people of infrasex sex is sometimes more easily subordinated to intellectual and emotional tendencies, usually of a negative character, than in a normal man or woman. Sex has no independent existence in a being of infrasex, or in any case it diners greatly from sex in a normal man or woman. To a man of infrasex, therefore, a normal man appears as a man possessed by some incomprehensible and hostile force. And a man of infrasex considers it his duty to struggle with this force in other people, because he believes that he has conquered it in himself. And this really explains the whole mechanism of the influence that infrasex has on life. Among other people the people of infrasex appear the most moral, in religion the most saintly. It is easy for them to be moral and it is easy to be saintly. Of course it is pseudo-morality and pseudo-saintliness, but people generally live with pseudo-values, and only extremely few wish to find real values. It is necessary to understand that almost all the morality which has been imposed upon the human race, almost all the laws controlling sex life, almost all the restrictions guiding people's choice and decision in these cases, all taboos. All fears, all these have come from infrasex. Infrasex, precisely in virtue of its difference from normal sex, in virtue of its inability to become normal and in virtue of its non-understanding of normal sex, began to regard itself as superior, began to dictate laws to normal sex. This does not mean that all morals, all laws and all restrictions relating to sex were wrong. But, as always occurs in life when right ideas come from the wrong source, together with what is right they bear within them a great deal that is wrong, that contradicts their fundamental essence. That brings about new confusions and new complications. In the whole history of mankind it is impossible to find a more striking example of pathological forms making laws for normal forms. Unless we take a broader view and realize that in fact the whole history of mankind is nothing but the rule of pathological forms over normal. Moreover, it is very characteristic that while infrasex continually holds in suspicion and mercilessly condemns normal sex and its manifestations, it shows much more tolerance towards pathological perverted forms. Thus infrasex always finds an excuse and a justification for people of intermediate sex and for their tendencies, as well as for various abnormal means of sexual satisfaction. Of course people of abnormal inclinations are by this very fact people of infrasex. But they are not aware of this and often are definitely proud of their difference from people of normal sex which they regard as coarse and animal, lacking the refinement they ascribe to themselves. There are even theories which regard intermediate sex as the result of evolution. All that has been said until now refers only to one category of infrasex, although in this category there can clearly be seen several forms, from impotence to homosexuality. The other category of infrasex does not include either impotence or unnatural inclinations. And, as was pointed out earlier, manifestations of this category, with the exception of extremes bordering on obvious insanity, are not usually taken as abnormal. Phenomena of this category can be divided into two groups. To the first group belong those manifestations of sex which are colored with what may be called the psychology of the lupaner. And to the second group belong those manifestations of sex which are characterized by their close relation to oppressive and morbid emotions of a violent or despondent character. 
Both groups can be explained by the fact that sex and all that relates to sex possesses the capacity to connect itself with the most contradictory sides of a human being. In the first group sex is connected with what is lowest in man. For such a man sex is surrounded with an atmosphere of uncleanness. A man speaks and thinks of sex with unclean words and unclean thoughts. At the same time he is a slave to sex and is aware of his slavery, and it appears to him that all other people are slaves, just as he is. He mentally throws dirt on sex and on everything connected with sex, invents indecent anecdotes or likes to listen to them. His whole life is full of obscene language, everything is as unclean to him as he is himself. If he does not degrade sex he derides it, takes it as a joke, tries to find something comic in sex. This looking for the comic in sex, the introduction of laughter into sex, gives rise to a special kind of pseudo-art, pornography, which is characterized precisely by derision of sex. Without this derision erotic art, even in its very extreme forms, may be quite normal and legitimate, as it was, for instance, in the Greek and Roman worlds, in ancient India, in Persia at the period of the flourishing of Sufism, etc. The absence of erotic art, or wrong forms of it, points, on the contrary, to the very low moral level of the particular culture and to the preponderance of infrasex. Infrasex in all its manifestations of course tries to confuse erotic art with pornography. For infrasex there is no difference between these two phenomena. With regard to normal sex, it is necessary to point out that there is no laughter in it. The function of sex cannot be comic, it cannot be an object of joke. This is one of the characteristics of normal sex. To continue the enumeration of the features of that form of infrasex which is characterized by the psychology of the lupaner, it may be said that this form is determined by the separation of sex from other functions. And by the antagonism of sex to all other functions. For the intellectual and for the emotional life, even merely for physical activity, in the case of the people of this form of infrasex, sex is only an impediment, an obstacle, a waste of force, a waste of energy. This waste of energy in sex functions and the realization of this waste is one of the distinctive traits of the form of infrasex in question. In normal sex this waste does not exist, since energy is immediately renewed because of the richness and positive character of the sensations, thoughts and emotions connected with sex. The form of infrasex in question is often very active in its manifestations in life, and is widespread. Owing to many peculiarities in our life, especially owing to the power of the abnormal over the normal and of the lower over the higher. Many people who do not in fact belong to infrasex learn about sex only from people of this form of infrasex, in words and expressions belonging to this form of infrasex, and they at once receive a shock from sex as from something unclean. They are repelled by the psychology of the lupaner, but they cannot throw off the impression they have received, they begin to believe that there is nothing else. And the whole of their own mentality in relation to sex becomes colored and impregnated with distrust, suspicion, fear and repugnance. And their fears and their repugnance in relation to this form of the manifestations of sex would be very well grounded if only they knew that the abnormal cannot be taken as the law for the normal and that in avoiding the abnormal it is important. Not to sacrifice the normal. Sex in this form is very closely related to crime, and actually in life a criminal character, criminal tendencies, are scarcely ever met with apart from this form of infrasex. Even in ordinary scientific psychology this form of sex manifestation, which is devoid of any connection with moral feeling, is defined as the lower or the animal. And it is the predominance of this form of infrasex in life which above all shows the level on which humanity stands. In the second group of manifestations of this category of infrasex, that is, in the group in which sex functions are not decreased but on the contrary are even increased in comparison with the normal. Sex is connected with all that is violent and cruel in a man. A man of this form of infrasex seems continually to be walking on the edge of a precipice. Sex and all emotions belonging to sex become in him inevitably connected with irritation, suspicion and jealousy. At any moment he may find himself completely in the power of a sense of injury, insulted pride, a frightened sense of ownership. 
and there are no forms of cruelty and violence of which he is not capable in order to avenge his outraged honor or injured feelings. All kinds of crimes of passion without exception belong to this form of infrasex. In chapter 10 were quoted the words of Professor Cholson, who wrote that, many efforts and prolonged work on oneself are necessary, in order to become accustomed to the teaching of relativity. But a much greater mental effort is needed in order to see, infrasex and nothing else in all the crimes and murders that are committed from jealousy, from suspicion, from desire for revenge, etc. But if we make this effort, and realize that in the figure of Othello for instance, there is nothing but pathology, that is, abnormal and perverted emotions, then the lies by which humanity has lived and lives become clear to us. The difficulty of understanding the nature of this particular category of infrasex is created by the continual embellishment of, and the desire to ennoble and justify. All manifestations of violence and degenerate emotions connected with sex and with crimes of passion. All the power of the hypnosis of art and literature is directed towards the glorification of these emotions and these crimes. It is this hypnosis which above all stands in the way of the right understanding of things and makes people who do not belong to infrasex at all consider themselves obliged to think, feel and act like people of infrasex. All that has been said about infrasex can be summarized in the following propositions. The first category of infrasex, from impotence to perversions, borders on manias and phobias, that is, on pathological proclivities and pathological fears. The second category, in its first, animal, form, is nearer to idiocy, to absence of moral feeling. And in its second, more violent, form it has resemblance to delusional insanity or homicidal mania, and even in its milder manifestations is full of fixed ideas and fixed mental images which are accompanied or evoked by tormenting and violent emotions. So far I have spoken chiefly of infrasex, but I have incidentally pointed out certain features of normal sex. Normal sex, being the complete opposite of infrasex, is first of all entirely coordinated with other sides of man's life and with his highest manifestations. It does not stand in their way and does not take energy from them. The energy used in the functioning of normal sex is immediately replaced owing to the richness of the sensations and impressions which are received by the intellect, the consciousness, and the feeling. Further, in normal sex there is nothing that can be the subject of laughter, or that can be connected with anything that may be negative in man. On the contrary it repels, as it were, everything that is negative, and this in spite of the very great intensity of sensations and feelings connected with it. It does not follow that a man of normal sex is free from sufferings or disappointments connected with sex life. So far from that, these sufferings may be very intense and acute, but they are never caused by the inner discord between sex and other functions, especially intellectual or higher emotional functions, as is the case in infrasex. Normal sex is coordinated and harmonious, but life is not coordinated and is not harmonious, therefore normal sex may often bring much suffering. But a man of normal sex does not blame other people for his sufferings and does not try to make others suffer. In his feeling there is a great understanding of the inevitability and fatality of everything connected with sex, and it is this understanding of inevitability that helps him to find a way through the maze of contradictory emotions. The contradictory and uncoordinated nature of many emotions connected with sex, apart from the influence of life in general and of various kinds of infrasex, is often due, in people of normal sex, to a different cause. This cause has hardly been touched upon by European psychology, though at the same time it is perfectly clear to ordinary observation. This cause is the difference between types. Science has approached and is approaching from different sides the idea of the difference of types, but the fundamental principles of this difference are as yet unknown. Until quite recently the old division into four temperaments with certain modifications was admitted. Some time ago there were established different types of memory, such as auditory, comma, visual, comma, narrative, and so on. At present there are established four types of blood, in endocrinology there are attempts to divide men into types according to their formula, or according to their constellations, that is, according to the combination of inner secretions working in them. 
But all this is as yet very far from the recognition of the radical and essential difference between various types of people, and from the actual establishing of these types. Exact and complete knowledge of types exists only in esoteric doctrines and therefore does not enter into the scope of the present subject. All that can be established by means of ordinary. In ordinary life, owing to the many external influences which control people's lives, the law of the attraction and repulsion of types becomes partly modified, but in one direction only. This means that even the right and corresponding types may be repelled by one another and not feel one another under the influence of emotional conflicts and difference in tastes and understanding. But wrong and non-corresponding types cannot ever or in any circumstances feel one another. Moreover, even the slightest element of infrasex either in the man or in the woman brings their relations, their feelings, and their sensation of one another down to a lower category, or even completely destroys all that was positive in them. If any escape from the law of the action of types is at all possible, it is possible only through following the principles of karma yoga and with the condition of a full understanding of the nature of the difference between types. But this relates to the life of those who see or are beginning to see. In ordinary life in general the leading principle is blindness. But this blindness is particularly striking in relation to questions of sex. Thus in ordinary understanding the idea is not admitted, and is even entirely unknown, that in the case of wrong combination of types one of them or both will not feel the other at all. Further, it is not taken into consideration that there is nothing more painful and more immoral than sex relations without sensations. Also that the degree and the quality of the sensations can be very different. The fact of the possible absence of sex sensations in sex relations is of course known, but it is not regarded as dependent upon types. This is not taken into consideration at all, undoubtedly owing to the influence of infrasex upon life. Nevertheless, people realize the danger of a wrong choice. And the intention to avoid the consequences of a wrong choice and entrust the choice to one who knows more lies at the basis of the esoteric idea of the marriage sacrament, which has to be performed by the initiate. The true role of the initiate certainly did not consist in performing a mechanical ceremony which allowed people to have sex relations. And people came to the initiate not for this ceremony, but for advice, for the final decision. The initiate determined their types, determined whether they were suited to one another or not, gave advice and decided whether the particular marriage could take place or not. Such was or such may have been the marriage sacrament. But of course all this was forgotten long ago together with the teaching on types and the idea of esoteric knowledge. Poets have always been aware of the other side of the idea and have son of the irresistible force which attracts inwardly related types to one another, types whom nothing can part and nothing can prevent from striving towards each other. When such types meet the result is a case of ideal and eternal love which gives material to poets for thousands of years. This idea of the mutual gravitation of inwardly related types constitutes the inner meaning of the allegory in Plato's Symposium, about people's severed halves seeking one another. But in actual life the dreams of poets and philosophers are very seldom realized, and in the conditions of our discordant existence the meeting of the most suitable types is, on the contrary, a very dangerous event. Because of the accumulation of stormy emotions, and almost invariably ends in tragedy, and in Plato's halves again losing one another. The teaching on types is of the highest importance because normal sex can manifest itself rightly, and in a certain sense, evolve, only with a successful combination of types. It is also necessary to understand that the division of types, in itself, is the result of evolution, because among more primitive people the types are divided less markedly and completely. So that strongly expressed type is a kind of secondary character. We must now try to establish what higher sex may be and whether any forms actually exist which can be considered as belonging to suprasex. But it is not an easy task to define suprasex. To be more precise, the scientific material at our disposal contains no data for such a definition. And for material bearing on this question it is necessary to turn to esoteric doctrines. All that it is possible to do, using the ordinary and generally accessible material, is to determine what is not supersex, 
because, though ordinary thought does not contain the notions of infrasex and supersex, the idea of them is very near to it, and, as it were, continually rises up behind ordinary conceptions. And very often in thinking of sex functions, people divide them, for instance, into purely animal or physical manifestations, which they look upon as infrasex, as it were, and spiritualized manifestations, which for them take the place of suprasex. Or they introduce the idea of love as opposed to sex feeling or sex instinct. In other words, the ideas of infrasex and suprasex are not so far from our thought as might at first appear. In fact people always use these ideas in thinking about sex, but very often associate them with totally wrong images and conceptions. Moreover, and this is particularly important, certain forms of infrasex are often taken for supersex. This happens because people, dimly realizing the difference in manifestations of sex but actually encountering besides normal sex only infrasex, have taken the degeneration of sex for the evolution of sex. In this case they have followed the line of least resistance, submitting to the influence of infrasex. And having taken infrasex for supersex, they have begun to regard normal sex from the standpoint of infrasex, as something anomalous, unclean, hindering the salvation or the liberation of man. It is only in those esoteric doctrines which have not passed through ecclesiastical and scholastic forms or have been preserved in their pure sense beneath the layers of ecclesiastical and scholastic forms. That traces of teaching on sex can be found which are worth attention. In order to discover these traces it is necessary to re-examine what is to be found on this subject in the doctrines of esoteric origin that are known to us. From the standpoint of esoteric doctrines the outward aim of sex, that is, the continuation of life, and also the perfecting of breed by the development of secondary characters, is regarded as mechanically assured. And the whole attention of these doctrines is turned towards the hidden aim, that is, the possibility of a new birth, which on the contrary is not assured at all. To return to the idea of transmutation or the intentional using of sex energy for the purposes of inner evolution. It must be noted that all the systems that recognize transmutation and the role of sex in transmutation may be divided into two categories. To the first belong those systems which admit the possibility of the transmutation of sex energy in conditions of normal sex life and normal expenditure of sex energy. To the second belong those systems which admit the possibility of transmutation only on the condition of complete sex abstinence and asceticism. Whether or not we agree with the fundamental propositions of the theory of transmutation itself, the systems of the second category. That is, those which admit the possibility of transmutation on the condition of asceticism only, are historically more familiar to us and more comprehensible. The reason for this lies in the fact that the principal religions of cultured humanity of the more recent epoch. Buddhism and Christianity, held and still hold this point of view, that is, that sex life is a hindrance to the salvation of man, or in any case something that can be admitted only as a sad necessity, as a concession to the weakness of man. Judaism also is nearer this point of view than the opposite one, and so is Mahometanism, which after all is nothing but Reform Judaism liberated only from a spirit of depression and despondency. But preserving almost the whole ethics of Judaism and a rather scornful attitude towards sex. Buddhism in its essence was a monastic order, and the teachings of Gautama the Buddha were always addressed to monks and contained the exposition of the principles and rules of the shortest way to nirvana as he understood it. Laymen were admitted to Buddhism only later, and only as disciples preparing to become monks. Special rules were made for them, which represented a mitigated monastic discipline. These are the so-called five precepts, the acceptance of which signifies the embracing of Buddhism. Sex is still admitted here. The third of these precepts reads, I observe the precept to abstain from unlawful sexual intercourse. This means that there are still certain forms which are considered lawful. But the next grade of Buddhism, eight precepts, includes a complete renunciation of sex life. The precept concerning sex reads, I observe the precept to abstain from sexual intercourse. That is, the word, unlawful, is omitted or, in other words, all forms of sex life, both abnormal and normal, are regarded as unlawful. 
Those who have accepted the eight precepts do not necessarily live in monasteries, but they live like monks. Thus Buddha and his nearest disciples considered the first condition of the transmutation of sex energy, the idea of which must have been clear to them, to be complete abstinence. Christianity stands very near to Buddhism in this respect, and it is quite possible that this side of Christian teaching developed under the influence of Buddhist preachers. The role of the Apostle Paul and the influence of Judaism in creating the Christian view of sex have been pointed out earlier. Great significance for the establishing of the Christian view of sex was contained in Christ's enigmatic words. For there are some eunuchs, which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs, which were nude eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs, which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it, Matt, 19. 12. With this passage are generally connected the following passages. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish. And not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Matt 5. 29, 30. These passages together have given material for many fantastic interpretations, beginning with a condemnation of sex life in general, as something unclean by nature. And ending with the teaching of the castrates and fanatical voluntary castration for the salvation of the soul. These gospel passages gave an enormous impulse to infrasex in the idea of struggle against normal sex. The true meaning of the above words of Christ cannot be understood without understanding the idea of suprasex, since Christ spoke of suprasex. But, before passing to the examination of what we can know of suprasex, it is necessary to establish a right view of other teachings on sex which are or were in existence, besides Buddhism and Christianity, that is. It is necessary to understand that the Buddhistic Christian view on love and sex is by no means the only possible or the only existing view. There are other forms of religious understanding of sex, in which sex, far from being condemned, is on the contrary regarded as the expression of the deity in man and is an object of worship. This is apparent even in modern Indian religions with their rows of lingams in the temples, with the ceremonial dances of an erotic character, and with the erotic images in the temples. I say even in modern Indian religions because they are undoubtedly degenerating in this respect and are more and more losing ground as regards their deification of sex. But there is no doubt that till quite recently several cults consisted entirely of the worship of sex and its manifestations. This view on sex is for us utterly foreign, incomprehensible and strange. For us it is, paganism. We are too much accustomed to the Judaistic Christian or Buddhist view of sex. But the religions of Greece and Rome and the still more ancient cults of Crete, Asia and Egypt, also deified sex, and their esoteric doctrines and mysteries saw the way to transmutation not in opposition to sex, but through sex. Which is the more correct it is impossible to say. We know too little of transmutation, of its possible results. If there are people who attain it, by that very fact they almost immediately leave our field of vision and disappear for us. But one thing can be said without any hesitation, if transmutation is possible, it is possible only for normal sex. None of the forms of infrasex can evolve. Only a grain that is sound can put forth a green shoot. A grain that is rotten within dies but is not born. However strange it may appear at first sight, the esoteric idea of the dual role of sex, and also the idea of transmutation, is much nearer to scientific thought than might be supposed, that is. Nearer to modern scientific thought than to the scientific thought of, let us say, the 19th century. A new branch of scientific physiology, which is already developing into a separate science and throwing an entirely new light on other sciences, chiefly on psychology, namely endocrinology, or the study of the glands of internal secretion. Promises a great deal in the direction of studying and establishing the properties and causes of man's various functions, among them the functions of sex and their relation to other functions. 
The starting point of the doctrine of internal secretions was the work of Claude Bernard on the glycogenic function, 1848 to 57, and Addison's account, in 1849, of the suprarenal capsules. This led to experiments by Brown Secord, who, in 1891, introduced the notion of specific substances secreted into the blood by the various organs, and also the concept of functional humoral correlation. Two theories were advanced to explain the mechanism of correlation. The first was the theory of hormones, the presence of which was established experimentally in 1902. The second was the theory connecting the endocrine secretions with the autonomic nervous system. Experiments, both surgical and by injection of gland extracts, were carried out on the adrenals, thyroid, parathyroid, and other glands, although, in the last 30 years, attention has been centered more on the pituitary body, which was visualized as leader of the endocrine system. That the internal secretions control the configuration of the body and are the activators of emotion, is emphasized by many writers. The psychological aspect of endocrinology, from the point of view of the psychological makeup of the individual, appeared later. It should be noted that, at present, opinion is divided as to whether endocrinology should include all parts of the body, on the ground that all organs give off chemical substances to the blood and lymph, or whether it should include only the ductless glands together with certain other glands of internal as well as external secretion. In what follows, endocrinology is taken as the study of the glands of internal secretion, and also of the glands of internal and external secretion, that is, as a part of a wider science, hormonology which studies the internal secretions of all organs. According to the data of endocrinology all the physical properties and functions of man, growth, nourishment, structure of the body, functioning of different organs, and also all the psychic life, intellectual and emotional. The whole psychic makeup of a man, his activity, his energy, his strength, all these depend on the properties and on the character of the activity of the glands of internal secretion, which produce motive power for the working of the organs, the nervous system, the brain, and so on. All the external characteristics, everything we can see in a man, his height, the structure of the skeleton, the quality of the skin, eyes, ears, hair, voice, respiration, way of thinking, quickness of perception, character, emotionality, willpower, energy, activity, initiative, all these depend on the action of the glands of internal secretion, and, so to speak, reflect their state. Endocrinology has made an enormous stride in the study of man, a stride the true significance of which is as yet far from being appreciated and understood. Scientific psychology, the development of which came to a complete stop about the end of the 19th century and which in the first decades of the 20th century did not produce a single work worthy of attention is beginning to acquire new force and to revise all its theories from the standpoint of the ideas of endocrinology. In the works on endocrinology which have already appeared there are some interesting attempts at the interpretation of the fate of historical personages from the point of view of the study of their endocrinological type, that is, of the combination of their internal secretions at different periods of their life. As an example of such attempts I will refer to two books by Dr. Berman of New York. In the first of these books, The Glands Regulating Personality, Dr. Berman, having indicated the principles of the endocrinological study of man which he follows, takes several historical personages with regard to whom there exist more or less definite data. The first of these is Napoleon, as known by his portraits, by the memoirs of his physicians, and by the data of the autopsy on his body in the island of St. Helena. On the basis of these data, Dr. Berman gives, so to speak, an endocrinological history of Napoleon, that is to say, he explains, from his point of view, under the influence of which glands of internal secretion the different periods of Napoleon's life passed. Thus Dar. Berman explains all the failures of Napoleon's last campaigns, ending in the catastrophe of Waterloo, by the weakening of the secretions of the pituitary gland, which became even more accentuated on the island of Esti. Helena and completely changed his personality. Later, Dr. Berman takes Nietzsche, Charles Darwin, Oscar Wilde, Florence Nightingale and others. In his second book, The Personal Equation, 
He examines types which result from a predominance of one or another gland, and considers man as a marionette controlled by glandular secretions. Dr. Behrman's books cannot be called scientific. They are rather fantasies on endocrinological themes. But Dr. Behrman's fantasies come very near to the real facts, which are not yet dreamt of in philosophy. From a strictly scientific point of view almost every separate conclusion of Dr. Berman can be refuted or regarded as unproved. And it is quite possible that each separate conclusion of Dr. Berman will be refuted, sooner or later. But what will not be refuted, but will on the contrary be established and proved, are the principles upon which he bases his reasonings. These principles will remain and will form the foundation for a new understanding of man, that is, new for modern thought, but in reality approaching the esoteric more and more nearly. In connection with the problem of infrasex and suprasex, what is of particular interest is the meaning and role of the internal secretion of the sex glands. And the effect of this secretion upon all the functions of man and also upon other secretions. As was established by physiology before the appearance of endocrinology as a separate science, the sex glands are at the same time glands of external and of internal secretion. And the internal secretion of the sex glands is the chief factor in creating and regulating the development of secondary sex characters. To such an extent is this so that in the case of injured sex glands or in the case of castration, when internal secretion ceases or is impaired, secondary characters disappear or become modified, and a man becomes a degenerate type of infrasex. Thus modern science not only admits the dual role of sex, but bases a great deal on it, recognizing in the internal secretion of the sex glands the necessary factor for the right functioning of the whole organism. And in the change or in the weakening of this secretion the cause of the weakening and deterioration of all other functions. The internal secretion of the sex glands is the transmutation already recognized by science. The normal life of the organism and the conservation of secondary characters depend on this transmutation. Every weakening of the secondary characters points to the weakening of the transmutation, a considerable weakening or a cessation of transmutation produces infrasex. The esoteric idea differs from the modern scientific view only in the admission of the possibility of the transmutation being increased and brought to a degree of totally incomprehensible and unknown intensity, which creates a new type of man. If this new type of man belongs to supersex, what then does supersex mean? Attempts at the endocrinological study of historical personages, as well as clinical investigations, establish quite clearly the facts of infrasex, their origin, causes and effects. But they say nothing about supersex. Where then can material for the judging of supersex be looked for? On the horizon of our history we see two superhuman figures, Gautama the Buddha and Christ. Whether we take them as real men who actually existed, or as myths, as creations of popular fancy or esoteric thought, we find in them common features. The story of the life of Gautama the Buddha tells us that in his youth Prince Gautama was surrounded by a brilliant court, full of beautiful young women, that he was married and had a son. He abandoned all this when he retired into the desert, and in his later life sex had no part. Except for several apocryphal legends, history has not preserved for us any description of temptations or struggle connected with sex. Jesus is even more definite from this point of view. We know nothing of his sex life. So far as we know there was no woman in his life. Even in the temptation in the wilderness the devil does not try to seduce him with a woman. The devil shows him the kingdoms of the world in all their glory, promises a miracle, but does not offer love. Evidently by the design, by the idea, of the author who created the drama of Christ, Christ was already beyond these temptations and these possibilities. We may now ask ourselves whether Christ and the Buddha were not men of supersex. There are no grounds which would permit us to classify them as belonging to infrasex. And at the same time both undoubtedly differed from ordinary men. Unfortunately we have no information concerning the structure of the body of Jesus and his external characters. All the representations of him of the first centuries are quite arbitrary. But with regard to the Buddha the position is different, 
because there exists a very exact and detailed description of the structure of his body and of all his external features and characters. I mean by this the so-called 32 signs of Buddhahood, and the 80 minor marks. Concerning these signs there exists a legend which was in part adopted by the writers of the Gospels in relation to Christ. When the Buddha was born, Asita, the old hermit, came down from the Himalayas to Kapilavastu. When he entered the palace, he offered the Urga sacrifice at the feet of the babe. Then Asita walked three times round the child, took him in his arms and, read, on his body the thirty-two signs of Buddhahood and the eighty minor marks that were visible to his inner sight. Modern Buddhologists, on the basis of philological and historical researches, consider the thirty-two signs to be a later invention. And certainly there can be no doubt that the 32 signs contain much that is conventional, much mythology, much naive allegory, and much that has been corrupted in oral transmission, in transcription and in translation. But in spite of all this an endocrinological study of the 32 signs of Buddha would be of enormous interest, and it is not impossible that it would lift for us the veil covering the enigma of supersex. There are several variants of the list of the 32 signs of Buddhahood or the 32 signs of perfection, as also of the 80 minor marks. In all cases the translation is very doubtful and there are many different interpretations of different signs. I will give here only the variant which is accepted in modern popular Buddhist literature. In transcriptions, translations and interpretations many signs have completely lost their meaning and significance. But I think that, first, a philological and, second, a psychological, analysis of the more reliable variants may furnish texts, the endocrinological study of which may reveal much that is new and unexpected. The 32 Signs of Buddhahood 1. A well-formed head and forehead. 2. The hair is blue-black and shining. Each curl grows from left to right. 3. Forehead is broad and straight. 4. Has a hair between the two eyebrows, turned to the right, it is as white as snow. 5. The eyelashes are like those of a newly born calf. 6. Has shining blue-black eyes. 7. Has forty teeth, all even. 8. The teeth are close together. 9. The teeth are pure white. 10. His voice is like that of Mahabrahma. 11. He has exquisite taste. 12. His tongue is soft and long. 13. His jaws are like those of a lion. 14. Shoulders and arms are beautifully molded. 15. Seven parts of the body are round and full. 16. The space between the shoulders is well filled out. 17. His skin has a golden color. 18. His arms are long so that when he stands without bending his hands can touch his knees. 19. The upper part of his body is like that of a lion. 20. His body is straight like that of Mahabrahma. 21. From each hair sack a single hair grows. 22. These hairs bend to the right at the top. 23. The organs of sex are hidden by nature. 24. The calves of his legs are full and round. 25. His legs are like those of a deer. 26. His fingers and toes are slender and of equal length. 27. His heels are long. 28. The instep of his foot is high. 29. Feet and hands are delicate and long. 30. Fingers and toes are covered with an epidermis. 31. His feet are flat and he stands firmly. 32. Under the soles of his feet two shining wheels appear with a thousand spokes. What deductions from the point of view of endocrinological theories can be made from a study of the 32 signs of Buddhahood? And can any deductions be made? I think this is a matter for specialists. One thing however is undoubted, which is that if we take the 32 signs as a real description of a living man, we shall be compelled to say that such men do not exist. Buddha combines in himself contradictory features. He has features which seem to point to femininity, others to infantilism, 
and side by side with these there are features which point to an exceptionally strong development of the masculine type. Speaking generally, Buddha's secondary characters are intermixed, and in such combinations they are not met with in life. Buddha is a strange and a new type of man. And as it can already be regarded as established that all external features and characters depend upon one or another form of the development of the glands of internal secretion. The picture of the development of Buddha's internal secretions must be something utterly improbable and new. Moreover, the internal secretion of the sex glands in his case appears to be not weakened, as it should have been, judging by several characters, but on the contrary intensified to an extreme degree. If this is transmutation, if this is supersex, does it not indicate the course our thought must take in endeavoring to understand the enigma of the evolution of man? And does it not mean that in the process of evolution sex energy, as it were, turns inward within the organism and creates in it a new life, capable of ever new, of eternal regeneration? If this is the way of the transformation, evolution, of man, it means that man is a strange biological type, whose sex period, the period of propagation, belongs to the lower, or middle, phase of transformation. If we imagine a butterfly whose function of propagation, instead of belonging to the butterfly, belonged to the caterpillar, then the butterfly in relation to the caterpillar would be supersex. This means that the function of propagation and consequently the function of sex would be unnecessary in the butterfly and would cease to act. This would be the biological scheme of man's stages in evolution. Is this possible? Is this probable? These questions cannot be answered with the material at present available. But the psychological picture of man's approach to supersex is a little clearer for us. There are in life strange emotions and strange sensations, inexplicable from an ordinary point of view, and in love and all sex sensations there is a strange melancholy and a strange sadness. The more a man feels, the stronger in him is this sensation of farewell, this sensation of parting. This sensation of parting arises from the fact that in a man, or woman, of strong feeling sex sensations awaken certain new states of consciousness, new emotions. And these new emotions change emotions of sex, cause them to fade and disappear. In this lies the secret of the deep melancholy of the most vivid sex sensations, there is a certain autumnal taste in them, the taste of something that must pass, must die, must cede its place to something else. This, something else, is the new consciousness, for the definition and description of which there are no words, but which, of all we know, only sex sensations approach. Mystical states possible to men show a very strange relationship between mystical experiences and experiences of sex. Mystical sensations undoubtedly and incontestably have a taste of sex. To put it more correctly, of all ordinary human experiences only sex sensations approach those which we may call mystical. Of all we know in life, only in love is there a taste of the mystical, a taste of ecstasy. Nothing else in our life brings us so near to the limit of human possibilities, beyond which begins the unknown. And in this lies without doubt the chief cause of the terrible power of sex over human souls. But at the same time sex sensations disappear in the light of mystical experiences. The first sensations of mystical experiences intensify sex sensations. But the further waves of the light that a man begins to see completely absorb and cause to disappear those small sparks of sensations which before seemed to him a blaze of love and passion. Consequently, in true mysticism there is no sacrifice of feeling. Mystical sensations are sensations of the same category as the sensations of love, only infinitely higher and more complex. Love, sex, these are but a foretaste of mystical sensations. It is clear that the foretaste must disappear when there comes that which has been anticipated. But it is equally clear that struggle with the foretaste, the sacrifice of the foretaste, the giving up of the foretaste, cannot bring nearer or hasten anything. Whether the struggle with normal sex is necessary for the attainment of supersex, or whether, on the contrary, supersex can be attained in the conditions of a normal functioning of sex, is a point on which the ideas of esoteric systems, as has been indicated before, differ very strongly. And as any contradiction between systems of esoteric origin is essentially impossible, this difference can have only one meaning. 
And this meaning is that there are types of people for whom the attainment of supersex is possible only through a struggle against sex, for their sex is not sufficiently coordinated with the other functions and does not evolve by itself. And there are other types of people for whom the attainment of supersex is possible without the struggle against sex, because their sex is transformed gradually in accordance with the transformation of the other functions. Ordinary knowledge has not sufficient material for determining the course of this transformation, nor for determining the essential nature of supersex. And only an entirely new study of man, started and conducted on the condition of the abandonment of all petrified theories and principles, can discover the ways to the understanding of true evolution. 1912 to 1929. From Global Gray, I really hope you enjoyed this book. It looked quite fascinating when I was doing it but it's also way out of my league in terms of understanding. You're obviously smarter than me. Anyway, if you haven't already, please think about donating a small amount if you've enjoyed this edition. Running the site takes me a lot of time, and money, and your support would be most appreciated. Thank you and I hope you visit Global Grey again, the next time you want some quality, free, ebooks.